Good evening and uh, welcome to International Week 2023. My name is Doug Weir and I'm the Director for Global Learning with University of Alberta International. The University of Alberta is located on the traditional territories of the Cree, the Blackfoot, the Métis, Nakota Sioux, Dene, Anishinaabe, and Haudenosaunee nations on land that is now known as part of Treaty 6, 7, 8, and homeland of the Métis. We are grateful to have the opportunity to live and work and gather tonight on this land and respect the histories, cultures, languages of First Nations, Métis, and Inuit nations. Welcome again to International Week 2023. And to the audience that's joining us live stream, a, a very warm welcome to you as well. iWeek is one of the University of Alberta's largest public events and one of our longest traditions. This is our 37th year. So to those of you who have been with us for many years as presenters, as organizers, <laughs> thank you for coming, Nancy and Carrie. Uh, welcome back. To those of you joining us for the first time, I hope you find the week inspiring and that we find you among our friends that join each year. The goal of International Week is to provide a forum for our campus and off-campus communities to share their views on global issues and their solutions for how together we can create a better world. The University of Alberta was ranked 11th in an international ranking that assessed universities on their contributions to achieving the UN Sustainable Development Goals. We are very proud of that accomplishment and very pleased that International Week is an opportunity to showcase some of the work of our communities. It's hard to believe it's Wednesday night and we're halfway through the week. It's also hard to believe how much more exciting things are yet to come. Tomorrow, the Faculty of Medicine and Dentistry hosts their uh, Global Health Talks that starts at nine and runs through the day with a keynote uh, speech at noon uh, by Dr. Madhukar Pai, who is the Canadian Research Chair in Epidemiology and global health from McGill University. Tomorrow night at the Metro Cinema, the Prince Takamoto Japan Center in the Department of East Asian Studies are hosting the film Nasika of the Valley of the Winds, followed by a discussion of the SDG themes found in that movie. And on Friday, we wrap up with our second Global Goals Talks. So I encourage you to come out and hear how students at the University of Alberta are contributing to solutions to the SDGs. And we'll also be joined by the um, Aravani Art Project, which is a collective working to address discrimination experienced by the transgendered community in India. But tonight, I am very delighted to be able to welcome Fariba to the, uni to, rather, the, to the University of Alberta and to thank you for joining us and to thank you for spending time with youth, uh, both at U School today and out at Linwood School. Um, I know that the students were excited and thrilled uh, to spend the afternoon with you, so thank you very much for that. Fariba Razi is uh, the founder and the executive director of Women Leaders of Tomorrow and its leadership in sport project, GOAL. GOAL stands for Girls of Afghanistan Lead. She was born and raised in Kabul, Afghanistan, and at the age of 18, she made history by competing in judo at the 2004 Olympic Games in Athens. Fariba's participation in those Olympics brought Afghanistan back to the world after the fall of the Taliban. She inspired hundreds of other Afghan girls to join different sports in a sports revolution for Afghan 
female athletes. I think FIBA, that is the first time I've heard of a sports revolution. FIBA was, has resided in Vancouver since 2001 and holds a Bachelor of Political Science from UBC. She has been and continues to be an outspoken and passionate advocate for women and girls' education, gender equity, human rights, and women's rights in Afghanistan and worldwide. Freeba is currently the man is managing the Afghan Women's Employment Program at the YMCA in Metro Vancouver and continues with her passion for judo as a level one NCCP certificate and teaching uh, women's self-defense as certified by Judo Canada. And, and as already I, I shared, sharing that passion with youth here in Edmonton today. So welcome, Freeba. Um, thank you for joining us. And I, I turn the podium to you. Good evening, everyone. Thank you so much for, the, um, for inviting me. Thank you so much, University of Alberta, for giving me this chance and the opportunity to speak about gender equality, women's rights in Afghanistan. Public speaking is not easy. I normally take a shot of tequila before my speech, but today <laughs> I didn't do that because I am passionate and I'm ready to speak about the important issues regardless of a shot of alcohol. Thank you so much again. And also thank you so much for the lovely introduction. I'm honored and I'm humbled to be standing before you here today and speak about my homeland. I am the um, founder and executive director of Women Leaders of Tomorrow. We are based in Vancouver. Uh, that's uh, my picture from 2004 Athens Olympic Games. I know, I was very cute, right? <laughs> so um, my mother wanted me to uh, have a long hair and be traditional Afghan girl, but I did the opposite. I cut my hair very short and I dyed it red. That put me on the spot. Not very safe, but that's exactly what I wanted to do. Here's a picture of me competing at the 2004 Athens Olympic Games. I am the one in blue, and that was a sports revolution, and that was the first time in the history of IOC and International Olympic Committee and uh, Afghanistan. I can't believe that it has been almost 20 years and everything has been halted and everything has been taken away from us. I would like to thank the University of Alberta for inviting me here today to speak to you on the topics of women's rights in Afghanistan. The United Nations Sustainable Development Goal number five states, achieve gender equality and empower all women and girls. To put it bluntly, the problem is the Taliban, period. Without the Taliban, Afghanistan would have only the same challenges as many other developing nations in the region, including patriarchal power structure, economic challenges, and similar issues. Where do I begin? How did we get here? Why the situation is so bad in Afghanistan? Why we have no gender equality in Afghanistan? And why women don't matter in Afghanistan? And why? being born a girl is a crime in Afghanistan and sin right now. How did we get here after 20 years of efforts, hundreds of billions of dollars, NATO countries and the international-led intervention in Afghanistan failed and resulted in the collapse of the central government in the middle of summer 2021? How did we get here? Let's begin with the review of the series of ugly historical events in Afghanistan. It's impossible to understand the present situation unless we know the past and unless we know what went wrong. The people of Afghanistan have suffered from war and chaos for over 40 years. The Soviet military intervention of the 1980s resulted in armed combat throughout the country 
with the Mujahideen, forces fighting a declared jihad against the centrally organized communist Soviet-backed government. In the 80s, the Mujahideen and allied groups were supported by the United States and the other Western powers with the arms and logistics to attack the Soviet army. Reagan and the United States saw an opportunity to humiliate the United the Soviet Union in, in much the same way that the United States had been at the conclusion of the Vietnam War in the middle of 1970s. Throughout the 80s, the foreign forces supported the anti-Soviet Mujahideen cared little or not at all about the religious ideology of those who were funding and arming. They were taking weapons and using them effectively against the Soviet army and the Soviet-backed Afghan army forces, and that was all that mattered, right? Weapons and support were funneled through Pakistan with the cooperation of its army, intelligence services, and military-run government. The dictator of Pakistan at that time, Zia al Haq, was a four-star army general who had seized power in a coup. His reaction to Soviet invasion of Afghanistan was to declare the fight against the Soviet army to be a righteous holy war against the infidel invaders. Ultimately, the Soviet, U Soviet Union's war in Afghanistan failed at the end of 80s for a wide variety of geopolitical reasons, not only directly related to Afghanistan itself, the Soviet Union had a number of domestic, economic, and political challenges which resulted in its own collapse in 1991. Faced with systematic economic and political problems which weakened it from the within, including losing all of its Eastern European client states such as East Germany, the Soviet U Union was no longer able to economically prop up the communist government in Kabul. The Mujahideen government had up until that point has been receiving the equivalent of tens of billions of dollars a year in economic support. The Soviet puppet state government collapsed in the 1990s, not longer after the withdrawal of this aid. Following this country, Following this, the country fell into a brutal civil war in the period of 1992 to 1996, in, the, in which many of those same groups had been previously fought the Soviet army, turned on each other in a struggle for power and control of the central government. The army was awash with a variety of Soviet and Eastern Bloc and armaments, which were used to deadly attacks by all sides. Ethnic Sunni versus Shia, religious strife resulted in artillery, mortar and attack, rocket attacks on entire district of major population cities, with or no regret for attempt at precision targeting. I can remember as a child that one of our neighbor's house was hit by a rocket near the center of Kabul. It took a direct hit in a rock, rocket attack and was utterly obliterated. Small bloody chunks of human flesh were thrown across upon the blasted landscape and rubble where the home previously stood once. It was at that time that I and my family fled to neighboring country Peshawar, Pakistan with the thousands and hundreds of other Afghan families. In the midst of this, in 1994, the Taliban established itself. I don't have enough time to on this speech to go into any extensive details of this. So I recommend everyone, anyone who's interested in this, in this topic to research about the origins of the Taliban and how they started in Kandahar. As concisely as possible, the Taliban began as a group of self-described religious scholars which had origins with the same, with some of the most religiously fundamentalist groups of the 1980s Mujahideen. Their origin and power base was Kandahar. Talib actually means the word student within the context of religious studies in a madrasa. So the Taliban, by literal dictionary, definition of the word simply means the students. 
primarily composed of ethnically, ethnically Pashtun and Pashtu speaking men with backgrounds in the Mujahideen struggle and the fundamentalist Sunni Wahhabis madrasas, the Taliban seized power in Kandahar in 1994 and began a harsh crackdown on the disorder and chaos of the active civil war. I should mention that Kandahar has always been a vastly Pashtun majority city. Pashto speaking and specific origins regions of the country has been much more religiously conservative than Kabul and other urban centers. As an alternative to the chaos of the ongoing civil war, many of the people of Kandahar welcome the relative stability of the new regime. Rocket, rockets stopped flying, mortar attacks ceased, and the Taliban implemented a Sharia law-based punishment regimes for all form of crime. PD thefts could be punished by amputation of a hand, hand murder punished by summer, summary death penalty, adultery and moral crimes were punished by stoning, which often also resulted in deaths. In the ongoing power vacuum and chaos, Caused by the civil war, the Taliban war, war were able to further reinforce its strength and seize power in Kabul in 1996, declaring the Emirate. The rockets stopped flying, mortar attacks stopped, and Kabul was briefly quiet again. I don't have enough time again, unfortunately, to explain it in details, but I do recommend everyone to do an independent research on this. In a brief description as possible, when the Taliban captured Kabul in 1996, it was a bombed out shell of a city inhabited by traumatized, nearly starving population. More than half of the city's population had fled as refugees to Pakistan, Iran, or other countries during the civil war. In photographs of the city from that era, the few that were taken by the Afghan journalists and foreign journalists with film cameras, shown buildings that took like photographs of the cities that were extensively bombarded during the Second World War. In declaring the Emirate, the Taliban brought the same policies and practices from Kandahar to their rule as a central government in capital Kabul. The same form of so-called Sharia law was implemented, imputations, executions, stoning, and obviously a ban on women on all forms of public life, including high school, higher education, sports, and employments, including banning women from going to the gym and even going to the local parks. There were a few foreign journalists in Afghanistan from 1996 to 2001 to document this from an objective, neutral point of view. Communication in and out of the country was very difficult. The situation at that time was not like we had today. There was no internet service in the country. The landline phone system had completely destroyed during the Civil War and the communication links in and out of the country were cut off. Satellite phones existed, but they weighed like 10 kilos, they were the size of a large piece of luggage, and were so prohibitively expensive that only that could be only afforded and operated by intelligent agencies, embassies, and deep-pocketed news organizations such as BBC and CNN. Very little real-time information about the Taliban's brutal regime from 1996 to 2001 escaped the country. Transmission of good quality video and photos out of the country was particularly difficult or delayed. The New York Times and a few other organizations reported accurately about what was going on, but it wasn't seen as a high priority for the international intervention. The US and NATO nations governments and their intelligent service agencies knew what the Taliban was and what, what they were doing, but it, was not see, but it was just seen as just another far away chaotic place suffering from unstable, non-democratically elected government. At that time, in the middle of 1990s, if the international community didn't intervene effectively in the Rwandan genocide, they certainly didn't have the will to prevent the Taliban from taking power. I wouldn't go into a detail, so much detail about 9-11, but very long, 
story short, the U.S. made a decision immediately following in the fall of 2001 to remove the Taliban from power because it had been harboring Al-Qaeda and other Wahhabis aligned international jihadist individuals and organizations, including Osama bin Laden. Following the American-led intervention in late 2001, which removed the Taliban from power in Kabul, the U.S. and the NATO countries organized the Bonn Conference, which had the stated goal of establishing an entirely new Afghan nation state, new constitution, and setting up the structure for democratically elected president, parliament, and regional provincial governments. Meanwhile, the Taliban had not been entirely eradicated as a force or as an ideological concept and retreated in the farthest rural regions of the country, which had always been their traditional power base. There isn't enough time for me today to go into deep in extensive analysis of Hamid Karzai and Ashraf Ghani governments and their ultimate failure and collapse in the summer of 2021. Pretty much everything that happened from 2001 until 2021 had been extensively documented by hundreds of journalists and authors. Dozens of thousands of books have been written in the political, about the political failures, corruption, NATO military combat against the Taliban and so on. Despite the corruption, despite the corruption, severe systematic struggles of the internationally recognized Karzai and subsequent Ghani government to run a functioning nation state, things improved greatly for women in Afghanistan following 2001. Schools reopened, universities reopened, women joined the workforce, and many began working with internationally funded development aid projects. Things weren't perfect by any means, and there was a huge divide between the literacy, education, and the participation level of women from rural district and those from the five or six largest cities in the country. In major urban areas, dozens of television stations opened, many of which employed female journalists, newspapers, and radio station flourished similarly and telecommunication companies organized themselves to provide basic voice and SMS phone services throughout the country. Internet service providers opened in all of the major cities and Afghans began talking to the outside world. To give you an idea how much things improved in Kabul, Kabul went from a population of 500,000 people during the middle of 1990s Taliban era to estimate of 4 million people in, in 2021. Afghans who had fled the country during the 80s and 90s, including my family, to countries all around the world returned and opened all sorts of businesses and began real estate development projects to support the booming population. We had Afghan star, like the equivalent of American Idol show, fashion shows, women walked on runways. We had all girls robotics team, sports team, including curling team, which was <laughs> supported by a Canadian fella. <laughs> True story. The streets were full of girls going to school, going to school in the mornings. Women ran businesses, women drove cars and bicycles. You name it, Afghan women did in Afghanistan. Again, things were not perfect. This massive boom in business growth and population was happening inside of the structure of the deeply corrupt Kabul civilian government, with bribery and graft treated as a regular cost of doing business. This was not significantly unlike other present-day developing nations. We, we have significant challenges with corruption. Under the in internationally recognized government prior to its 2021 collapse, women were able to own businesses and participate fully and actively in the economy. Significant cultural and family pressure barriers remained, but they didn't risk flogging or imprisonment just for exercising their basic rights to participate in the economy. It was in 2001 when my family returned from Pakistan to Afghanistan, hoping that there will be peace. We were promised freedom, democracy, gender equality, and, and life. We, we thought that we have the right to live in our homeland once again. 
After 2001, the NATO forces and internationally recognized new Afghan government were also responsible for the creation almost entirely from a scratch of a new national army and national police force. In the 20 years period of the post-2001 civilian government, there were significant challenges with these organizations, including endemic corruptions within army and police, such as ghost soldiers and police on the payroll who didn't exist whose salaries provided by the US NATO funding or support were pocketed by corrupt commanding officers. The United States Cigar, Special Inspector General for Afghanistan Reconstruction, a conjecturally chartered independent auditor has documented all of this extensively. For those interested, specifically in the collapse of Afghan National Army and police force, please read their reports. One of the highest priority missions of the new National Army was to combat the Taliban, which they never truly been defeated. They had retreated into their ruler heartland and traditional areas of power to regroup themselves, rearm themselves, and prepare for the day that the US and NATO lost the political will to continue ongoing financial and military support. Canadians in particular will be familiar with the stories of the Canadian Army's ground combat operations in ruler parts of, parts of Kandahar province against the Taliban from 2006 to 2010. NATO military attempt, attempted to mil militarily defeat the Taliban at the cost of the hundreds of billions of dollars. Massive military facilities were built and upgraded at a place like the Kandahar Air Base, Bagram Air Base, and the UK Army and Camp Sebastian in Helmand province, and so on. One of the fundamentalist challenges that the NATO militaries face is that they were equipped, trained, and designed to fight another equivalent technology nation state military that wears uniforms, drives recognizable vehicles or armors, uses known and recognized airplanes and helicopters. The Taliban and the ruler jihadist faces, including those who declare themselves to be ideologically ISIS, opposed to the new central government, were the exact opposite of what the NATO forces thought. They wore civilian clothing, sandals, drove around using civilian vehicles and motorcycles, and made an extensive attempt to blend into the ruler population in the areas of traditional power base in south of the country. This made combating the Taliban very difficult. You, you can't just arbitrarily drone strike a group of men who happen to be wearing flip-flops and standing around an old Toyota pickup in Kandahar. They employed textbook guerrilla warfare tactics, striking against government and ISAF targets and then withdrawing, melting back into the civilian population and quickly hiding their weapons. Mistakes were made by NATO forces. There have been documented instances of the civilian homes which were struck by missiles, believed to be inhabited by the Taliban, but in reality it turned out to be a simple wedding party in, in Daikuni province. <sighs> Mistakes like these further exacerbated the problem in the relationships between deeply conservative ruler population and their opinion of the endemically corrupt civilian government in Kabul. One of the things that foreigners may not know about Afghanistan is that prior to the government collapse in middle of 2021, ISIS known as Daesh established a dangerous and active presence in the country. Believe it or not, large groups of religiously fundamentalist men who had been previously aligned themselves with the Taliban came to believe that the new modern Taliban was too secular and too liberal for their liking. At the same time, they began watching and reading the propaganda coming out of the ISIS organization in Iraq and Syria around that time that they reached their extended uh, attention uh, in, 20, uh, 20, um, in 2015. 
Entire groups of previously Taliban-aligned fighters re-announced their allegiance to the Taliban and instead proclaimed a new caliphate of so-called pure ideology. ISIS Khorasan and began conducting terrorist attacks domestically within Afghanistan against Shia religious groups whom considered to be infidels. Even today, under the present Taliban regime, ISIS groups continue to conduct bombing and terrorist attack against the Shia groups, women and education centers, including a recent suicide bombing of a tutoring center that killed more than 50 teenage boys and girls in the capital, Kabul. By early 2021, the United States and NATO forces present in the country had been reduced to approximately 12,000 in total. It spread between Bagram, Kandahar, and a few other noteworthy military bases. They were for the most part not engaged in the active and direct combat against the Taliban as previous years, but they were operating in a rule support for the Afghan National Army. The NA and A National Afghan Army, although it had not accomplished the goal of defeating the Taliban, had been successfully up until that point in preventing the Taliban from capturing any provincial capital cities, in entire provinces, or any other major cities in the country. The ANA was, however, deeply dependent upon the United States, provided financial and logistical support for things such as foot soldiers, ability to use a secure radio system to call in an airstrike on Taliban and Taliban position, helicopter-based resupply of forward operating bases and outpost positions, medical evacuations by helicopter, and so on. There were also several thousands of U.S. and NATO civilian contractors, employees responsible for maintaining the helicopter and ground attack aircraft of the National Army and providing other essential te technical and logistical support for the Army was not yet capable of doing on its own. In that situation, and the U.S. NATO forces reduced from a peak of 140,000 to less than 12,000 in 2020 and in early 2021, Donald Trump and his State Secretary of State Secretary Mike Pompeo entered into negotiations with the Taliban, the so-called Doha Agreement, which was conducted in Doha, Qatar, was a multi-month negotiation process in which the United States Department directly engaged with the Taliban and obtained promises from that that they would respect fundamental human rights and women's rights. The gist of the agreement was that the Taliban would agree to push peacefully join a civilian government and lay down their arms while simultaneously respecting all forms of human rights, would promise not to harbor international jihadists, arm, armed groups such as Al-Qaeda or others. In exchange for this, they received a promise from Trump for the absolute withdrawal of U.S. Army forces from their remaining bases down to the last man. Donald Trump and Pompeo set a firm arbitrarily deadline for this withdrawal to occur in spring of 2021. Today, in February 2023, having seen what the Taliban has actually done versus what they actually promised in 2020, only a fool could say that the Doha deal was a good idea or could be considered to, be a, to have a peaceful outcome. Once the Taliban were quite certain that, the, that Trump really that intend to completely and absolutely withdraw U.S. forces from the country, it, it became apparent to retrospect that post-collapse analysis that immediately began up preparation and planning to recapture the entire country. They had no intentions of ever abiding by the nice-sounding promises that they made to Zulmay Khalilzad, pa Mike Pompeo, and representative of the United States in Doha in 2020. These were empty words meant to temporarily plague the leadership of NATO countries and sufficiently gullible international journalists that Taliban was new, modern, reformed organization and not the same Taliban had ruled so harshly from 1990s to 2001. Human rights, women's rights, gender equality, economy, democracy, freedom, and rule of law were on the bottom of the list for Donald Trump. 
in spring of 2021, the Biden administration foolishly decided to follow along with the Doha agreement and plan from Trump and Pompeo, they began withdrawing U.S. forces from the two remaining bases, Bagram and Kandahar, at the same time, canceling and removing all of its logistical, financial, and military supports of the Afghan National Army. It was only a matter of a brief interim period of few chaotic months from that day that last American got an airplane departing, departing from Bagram Air Base until the day the army collapsed. The Taliban began capturing small provincial capitals in remote areas of the country. Once it became apparent to them that they had been able to capture these population centers with no air strike forthcoming, no drone strike, no armed helicopter response, that it became clear how hollow the national army forces really were in terms of realistic military capability. By, by middle of summer 2021, they had ruled throughout the, of the cities in the country with the army soldiers taking off their uniforms and fleeing into the civilian population. The Taliban captured vast quantities of United States and NATO provided military equipment and vehicles previously operated by the army, which only further emboldened them and empowered them. I am sure that we all have seen all the famous black and white photographs of the final helicopter taking off the roof of the United States Embassy in Saigon at the ultimate conclusion of the Vietnam War. The NATO-led intervention in Afghanistan has a similar moment, but much uglier. There is the well-known video of throngs of desperate persons running along an American Air Force C-17 cargo airplane on the runway of the Kabul airport, with the several men clinging to the landing gear and falling to their deaths. The ugly and desperate situation of August 2021, evacuation of the Kabul airport has been inevitably seared into the minds of every Afghan and every NATO military member who ever served in Afghanistan. Dozens of thousands of Afghans had worked for internationally funded development projects. Militaries, media organizations, businesses, and NGOs knew immediately that they would be targeted for the death by the Taliban, and they did. This is a recent if, uh, enough event that I'm sure that almost everyone has seen the video, what happened at the Kabul airport in August 21. There's another slightly more hopeful photograph of, photograph of more than 800 people, many of them were women and children, packed a standing room only into the American C-17 airplane in one of those evacuation flights from Kabul. That set the world record for the largest number of persons on a single airplane ever. At the time of the evacuation in August 2021, I received hundreds of desperate messages from young women, from young women from Afghanistan, trying to find any possible way to flee the country. All these women were young women who grew up entirely in the post-2021 new modern Afghanistan. I, will, I still continue receiving those desperate messages from young Afghan women on a daily basis. Everything I have said to you until now is just to provide the barest minimum of historical, political, and military context to better understand the present situation in Afghanistan. There has been truly a spendous amount of chaos, strife, and economic, political, social events in the past 40 years. Any of these eras in the history is deserving of thousands of pages of textbook analysis, and I'm sure that deep within the intelligence agencies and various NATO countries have more detail or val available that might see light of the day in another 25 to 30 years. All of the above, an ugly, chaotic history of Afghanistan brings us to the present day. With the Taliban firmly in constant in power in Kabul and ruling by dictatorial decree. Despite all the nice sounding promises they made in 2020 Doha agreement to respect women's rights and human rights and girls' rights and human rights in general, it has been extremely obvious since August of 2021 that the Taliban has no intention of obeying by any of the promises they made. At the time of their capture of Kabul, capital Kabul, so-called new modern Taliban, invited 
international journalists to series of press conferences which they promised all of the same thing had earlier said in Doha. The reality has been different. One of the international media and world's once the international media and world's attention was sufficiently distracted, several months after the capture of Kabul, they began a pr process of incriminatingly reversing every human rights and civil rights again made under the previous civilian government. As as of now, the Taliban have banned girls from education above grade six, banned girls and women from high school, banned women from all forms of university in education, and banned women from working for businesses or international aid and development NGOs. Additionally, all forms of sports for women have been shut down including the judo and martial arts centers. Mobile phone videos have escaped from the Taliban held ruler district showing new Sharia law punishments, flogging, executions, and imputations, exactly the same thing that they did back in 1990s. The only major difference is now that Taliban has captured a different country, a, a different country then with several scared, devastated cities that they were originally occupied in 1996. Kabul now is a bustling and crowded city of more than 4 million people with a functioning electricity grid, mobile phone internet services with G4 LET data plans, a dozens of televisions, a modern international air, airport refurbishing highways to the Pakistan border. The infrastructure of the major cities of Afghanistan benefited from billions of dollars of international and development, uh, international organization, development age, aid funnel into the civilian government after 2001. If the internet had existed in 1996, the Taliban probably would have destroyed it. But in the modern era, the Taliban's official media spokesperson is a Twitter addict. He tweets, and they made extensive use of social media for their own propaganda. If there is any small consolation for the people of Afghanistan, it is that Taliban has not chosen to destroy the mobile phone networks and internet services providers of the country. The situation right now for the internet censorship and blockage of content is actually somewhat better than a, a number of other authoritarian regimes in the world. Not because the Taliban wouldn't like to block things, but because right now they don't have the tactical capability or knowledge to do effectively without shutting everything down. I'll tell you more about that later, how we are using the internet access from home to, home to support Afghan women's education in Afghanistan right now. The new modern Taliban are also much more worldly media savvy and educated than, than the madrasa students who first seized power in 1996. Many of their spokesperson and figureheads speak nearly fluent English to talk to the international media. They have timed the release of new decrees and crackdowns on human rights carefully when international news media is distracted elsewhere. Some of their hardest crackdowns and Imposition of new restrictions were put in place at almost exactly at the same time the Russian ground invasion of Ukraine began in the spring of last year and received barely any media attention or coverage outside of the journalists and NGOs who focus in Afghanistan. Let's review for a moment the definition of fascism as provided by the Encyclopedia Britannica. The first definition is a way of organizing a society in which a government ruled by a dictator controls the lives of the people and in which people are not allowed to disagree with the government. Second definition, very harsh control and authority. By all measures, by all modern society, the Taliban meets the definition of fascism. The self-appointed Amir, Zayb Haibatullah al-Khunzada has named himself the ruler, the, the supreme ruler of the country and rules the government within a strictly hierarchical system organized underneath himself. I can tell you confidently from a perspective of Afghan Muslim women that the ideology that Taliban is not, is not actually Islam. They have twisted and perverted the ideology of a noble and gentle religion into something that is barely recognizable. 
so-called the Amir of the Islamic Emirate has clocked himself in the rhetoric and language of fundamentalist Sunni, Saf Salafist, Wahhabis religion because it serves their political goal to obtain and hold on to absolute dictatorial power throughout the country. Nothing more. If I can translate a concept from the local languages in Afghanistan and Islamic religious perspectives into the English, the Taliban calling themselves an emirate is roughly equivalent to a group of armed men seizing the capital of a modern Western country by force, putting a new king on the throne and declaring themselves a kingdom with a fundamentalist state's religion organized under some fanatical novel and schism from an existing Christian church. The restrictive edicts you issued by the Taliban leadership have gone far beyond even the most conservative religious countries in the world, Saudi Arabia. In Saudi Arabia right now, women are allowed to go to school. Women are allowed to go to university and ob obtain bachelor's, master's, and PhD degrees. They can own businesses, participate in financial and investment markets, and own properties. There are Saudi amateur and semi-professional and professional women's sports teams for dozens of different sports, abide with the prohibition of male in spectators. Although the participation of Saudi women in businesses and government administration is much less than it should be to achieve anything resembling real gender equality, they are allowed to become educated and hold jobs in a very recent legal change or even that women are allowed to drive cars. It is still an insult to basic human dignity and human rights that the head of a kingdom's royal family must issue an edict allowing women to do something before they can actually do it. There remains significant and very concerning human rights and freedom of speech, freedom of press, and women's rights concerning today in Saudi Arabia. Nobody, nobody who has followed the news has said the opposite, especially when it comes to the history of uh, journalist Jamal Khashenji. Mohammed bin Salman, as the absolute ruler of the country and other recent news, will have serious cause for concern about Saudi Arabia. I have digressed into a description of human rights situation for women in Saudi Arabia because it serves a well-documented baseline to illustrate just how far beyond that the Taliban have gone in their restrictions. By most measures, Saudi Arabia is the most religious, religious conservative country in the world and also bases its legal code to, on a strict interpretation of Shuni, Shuni, Sunni Sharia law. Everything that I just described, which Saudi women can do right now, the Taliban has shut down completely for women in Afghanistan. The international community and free nations of the world must ensure that the Taliban regime occupying the seat of power in Kabul never is recognized as a legitimate government. There is a very real risk as that, that as the Taliban's occupation of Kabul drags on, eventually after some periods of years, some countries will normalize and resume full diplomatic recognition of them as a legitimate government. Just last week, I saw a video from a local Afghan television news of a Russian ambassador to, ambassador to Kabul meeting with delegation of the Taliban and mo with the most senior leadership, shaking hands and grinding at each other. It should come as no surprise that the authoritarian and dictatorial regime of Putin seems happy to establish relationships with the Taliban. There have also been signs of warming and diplomatic relationships between the Taliban and Chinese government in Beijing. China has expressed an interest in making use of Afghanistan's well-documented mineral and gas resources. In January 2023, in a public public press release event attended by many dozens of journalists, a, res a representative of the state-owned Chinese National Petroleum Corporation signed an agreement with the Taliban for an extraction license revenue sharing for all, drill for all drilling of natural gas fields in the north of the country. The withdrawal of the U.S. and NATO forces and international support for the previous civilian government has resulted in catastrophic economic collapse 
in Afghanistan. The economy is in dire shape and unemployment is high. The Taliban have found themselves with a huge hole in the government budget and various ministries that were previously propped by the international funding. Based on their own statements in press conferences and warming relationships with China and Russia, it's also apparent that the Taliban has no qualm whatsoever about entering into new relationship with other non-democratically elected governments and regimes. It is vitally important that the Taliban regime, as it stands now, must not be permitted to send an ambassador to occupy Afghanistan's seat at the United Nations General Assembly in New York City, or reopen Taliban-run embassies in capitals of the free and democratic countries in the world. As of today, in February 2023, there are four possible paths for, forward for the Taliban regime as a, and a nation of Afghanistan. I'll call them scenario A, B, C, and D. Scenario A, the Taliban continues business as normal and maintains its present status quo with the strict Sharia law, total removal of women and girls from education and workforce, and remains an international pariah state. It is possible that under the situation, some of the countries in the world will normalize relationship with them, such as Russia and China. As I have just described, the country will remain in dire economic circumstances and a such situation also has a very real danger of becoming a training and supporting basis for internationally, internationally run jihadist organization which seek to conduct attacks elsewhere in the world. We clearly have seen how the continued presence of success of the Taliban and ISIS in their geopolitical heartland emboldens them. Fundamentalists radicalize young men elsewhere in the world, such as those who have conducted bloody, bloody and brutal jihadist terrorist, terrorist attacks in France and Belgium in recent years. Scenario B. The Taliban remains in power but moderates its own policies and edicts to become equal to the equal but not more restrictive than other highly conservative Islamic countries in the world. This is a theoretical scenario in which the Taliban listens to the advice presently being given to them by the Qataris and other forms of government policies in line with the present status quo in Saudi Arabia and similar countries. If a such new, modern, liberal, and open-minded Taliban were to actually exist in the future, significant human rights and women's rights challenges would still exist, as they do in Saudi Arabia. But the situation would certainly be better than it is now. If such a moderation does come to pass, it will also enable international aid and in development NGOs to operate within the country once again. Scenario C, catastrophic collapse of the Taliban into civil war. It's possible that the dire economic situation that Afghanistan finds itself now and the Taliban's harsh decrees will result in schism within the Taliban or its own internal collapse and civil war. This could also result from Taliban's institutional inability to operate the various functions of a real government it is very good at conclusion guerrilla attacks and issuing decrees actually operating the bureaucracy of a nation state of 30 million people, not so much. If this happens, it will be very ugly situation and very, very possible hundreds of thousands of civilians will perish into the ensuing fracture of the country along ethnic religious lines and pro and anti-Taliban functions and domestic civil war. This is probably the worst case scenario. Scenario D, international intervention to remove the Taliban. Again, as a result of the some catastrophic 9-11 or similar scale event, this is a very real possibility as the Taliban continues to domest domestically harbor and provide aid and moral support to international jihadists and terrorist groups. Last year, the United States conducted a targeted drone strike against a senior Al-Qaeda commander who the Taliban had set up to a luxury mansion in the wealthiest district of Kabul 
a city. I can't predict what sort of events might happen, when or when, but something sufficiently catastrophic would provide the political capital needed in the United States and NATO countries to once again forcibly remove the Taliban from power by military means. Such a scenario seems like it might be a repeat of 2020-2001, but it has the possibility to be different if we learn from the lessons of our past. It might be possible to learn from the mistakes of what happened with this, the structural problems of the previous post-2001 new constitution and government and put in place an entirely new and different system of government, government that can be the needs of the civilian population and can earn, maintain their trust without endemic corruption and graft. I don't know which of those scenarios I have I've just described will come to pass. At this point, almost everything is possible. NATO countries and European attention is focused on very good reasons on the ongoing war in Ukraine and struggles of the Ukrainian people in reclaiming every square foot of their territory from the brutal Russian invaders. Whatever is going on with Afghanistan is seen by NATO as a second priority to that war. The international news media shows shocking drones, drone video from Mariupol and cities nearly obliterated by the Russian army. It is a dire situation, and the resumption of fighting with the spring offens offensive in Ukraine just a few weeks away. As educated, politically active, and responsible citizens of NATO countries who pay attention to international news, we must support all of the peoples throughout the world that are presently engaged and in their struggle against authoritarian regime, fascism, and the dictatorial government. Ukraine is extremely import important, but we must maintain the capacity and resources to address more than one such situation simultaneously. Afghanistan, obviously, but we must not forget, ignore or normalize other severe problems. The Myanmar coup d'etat and the brutal military dictatorship. Bashar al-Assad still occupies the presidential palace in Syria and is known as a war criminal. Remembrance of ISIS still exists in Iraq and Syria. The leaders of second military coup in two years in Mali have recently cut a deal with the Russian Wagner mercenary groups for so-called military assistance. And in addition to all that, we need to retain the capacity to provide urgent international aid and relief to disasters such as the recent earthquake in Turkey. All of this brings us to the present day. My organization, Women Leaders of Tomorrow, is active in a number of programs. Our online English language tutoring program matches young women in Afghanistan with English language tutors in the United States and Canada. We have recently completed a cohort of 45 program participants and are enrolling young women for the next group. They spend several hours each week working with their tutors by video conferences over the internet with the goal of improving their capabilities to communicate with the outside world while effectively trapped inside their homes by the Taliban. It looks like it looks likely that online education and distinct learning will be only educational opportunities available to female domestic students in Afghanistan for the foreseeable future. Through our through through our partnership with generous donations from Canadian and international businesses, Women Leaders of Tomorrow has welcomed the 10 Afghan women on full ride scholarship to University of British Columbia, where they are studying towards their master's degree in several STEM fields. Six of them are mining engineers. Additionally, we have obtained three full scholarships for young women to complete their grade 11 and 12 at high schools in uh, Vancouver and Victoria area. Through our partnership at Langara College, a community college in Vancouver, five women have arrived through the evacuation program are now enrolled as domestic students and studying towards their college degrees. 
Our judo coach and one of our judo athletes from Kabul were recently, they have recently received permanent asylum status in Norway and after a brief stay in Turkey were now getting settled into new lives as Norwegians. From the time of the government collapse to present day, I have received pleas for help from thousands of similarly young women, women who stuck in, in the country in 2022. In 2022, I wrote a letter to the Prime Minister signed by the entirely Canadian Olympic gold medalist from Tokyo 2022, asking that the government assess the asylum and resettlement of women athletes from Afghanistan. These women are particularly targeted by the Taliban for the Sharia law punishment based on their previous sports activity. On December 10, 2022, on the United Nations declared International Day of Human Rights, Women Leaders of Tomorrow launched a campaign named hashtag, quote, education is my right. Young Afghan women and girls in Afghanistan and in many international locations posted our campaign on all forms of social media to demand the Taliban to allow women to go back to school and resume all schools. Thank you. Yeah, good idea. Okay, uh, um, we're going to take questions from the audience. Nadine has a mic. Uh, Friba is going to join me here. She's going to just catch her breath, as you can imagine. It's a, it's a big breath that needs to be catched right now. <laughs> and uh, and then when she's ready. Um, Nadine will pass the mic. I have already one hand here and one hand in the back there, Nadine. So, um, come. Okay. Thank you. Thank you very much for a very uh, inspiring talk and on the history. Um, I have two questions. Um, First of all, do you think if there is any public support of Taliban government in Afghanistan? Yeah. Or is, is they solely depend on their military power? Um, as I also mentioned um, in my speech that uh, Taliban started from Kandahar. So there are some people who are supporting them in Kandahar because that's where their traditional base is and that's where um, their, their origins are from so they are getting the public support but they are not popular um, some villages supported that and based on the reasons I also mentioned that because of the so bad corrupted previous government some people some villagers they saw that Taliban as a as a solution for the highly corrupted previous uh, government and the chaos okay, okay. Um, another question um, what do you think that uh, why they, what was the reason that the hatred of uh, Taliban they, why they hate so much from women what's the root causes or what the, what's the, in your opinion what's the reason for that we are also trying to find that out we also want to know what we have done that's so wrong why being a woman is it's a sin why women girls are discriminated from a young age but based in my experience um, because I was born and raised in Afghanistan and what I've heard what I have seen what I've experienced um, Taliban are using their religion as a political tool to gain their political agenda and to achieve that and also they're using religion as a tool to control women they are the ultimate version of patriarchy they found this tool to be very helpful and effective to control women. They just want women to, uh, to be wives, faithful wives, obedient wives at home and bear children and nothing more. They don't actually believe that women can achieve more than just being able to give birth, stay at home and uh, be a mother. Those are best, uh, and it has been proven to a great extent. Um, it's all about fascism it's all about power dominance and control uh, hello 
Um, so I wrote it down here, and I asked, I want to ask, um, since um, establishing a, a Women Leaders of Tomorrow, uh, what have you found was the most difficult uh, aspect to uh, bringing it all together? And especially when you're bringing other women out of uh, these situations, have you ever felt that um, the safety of you or other people were ever threatened p just by existing? It's absolutely dangerous and uh, risky. Um, I took a huge risk when I um, responded to those students' um, uh, messages um, on WhatsApp, Messenger, as well as emails. Um, it's very dangerous. We are very creative and conscious here, too. How can we support women from Afghanistan without risking their lives or their families' lives? One of our students uh, who was accepted by an independent school in Vancouver, she was only 17 years old, and she was in Herat, in Herat province, and she, had, she didn't have passport, but she was very intelligent, and she qualified for the scholarship. What we did is uh, we had to support her mother and brother as well to be evacuated from Herat to a neighboring country, Pakistan, and very keeping it very low key so they don't drink, uh, draw attention from the Taliban, where is she going, why she's not accompanied by her uh, older brother or father. So it was extremely dangerous, and they managed to go across the border from, from, Pakistan, from Afghanistan to Peshawar, Pakistan, and from Peshawar go to Islamabad. And then from there, we processed their um, visa application through IRCC, um, through um, Canadian High Commission as well. So we are very careful. For example, we are so careful that um, all of our students and volunteers in Afghanistan, they are not even mentioning the name of uh, the organization in Afghanistan because I'm sure you recently heard the, the news about Taliban banning women from working for international NGOs, and we didn't want them to know that we existed in Afghanistan. I'm safe in Canada, but they are not. So um, they don't mention everybody is at home, everybody is keeping it very low-key, and everybody is in survival uh, mode, but those whom we can support, we can and we will. And I personally will never give up. Um, I have received death um, threats. I have received a lot of strong messages from the from from, Af from Taliban from Afghanistan too. Honestly, I don't care. I'm just getting tired of them. For me, it's just like another angry man at me, right? With with the with the turban and a beard. But I am very careful with. Um, with the girls, so it, it is possible 100%. For that, you need to have a good community, you need to have a good support group that everybody is aware of the danger of the situation and you wanna support those girls accordingly and as safely as possible. Thank you. So, hello, this is Mohammed. Uh, thank you for the nice presentation. Uh, I am from south of Afghanistan, which is the northern uh, you can say Waziristan. Uh, I think the situation in Afghanistan, the people, is you ex the, the way you explain about the uh, Taliban, uh, I believe is my experience is not like what it is. So I think the occupation of the NATO and the USA, they kill so many in um, indiscriminately people killed. And now I think the people are more welcoming the Taliban than uh, the previous, the past government, they didn't like it in, anymore. So I believe that um, if there is an open, um, if the people ask openly, I think uh, most of the people will like uh, that, uh, yeah, we, 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 we want uh, Taliban. There are some pockets in Kabul inside. They might be trying to escape or something like that, but due to so indiscriminately killing by the uh, B-52, that was very, and the people are very scared of that. I am also from the village where several people killed by uh, the drone and indiscriminately. So I think the situation is very, very, what should I say, trouble. And I think the situations you are, uh, the, the, the idea you are seeing in the last, is you are still hoping that the uh, NATO and USA will come and you call it intervene, but I think the people call their occupations. So I don't think so that it's, it's, it's a solution like that. So I think we have to relax from one side and 
the extremism of the Taliban should be from the other side, and they come to a common consequences. So yeah, absolutely. Law. Thank you yeah. so much for that comment. Um, as I mentioned, mistakes were ma made. NATO uh, intervention was not the best solution. And unfortunately, we don't, we don't exactly have their, the absolute recipe to this. But the intervention in the NATO countries and uh, North American countries getting involved is the best solution for now. Because it's not just a matter of the Taliban. It's not just a matter of Afghanistan. Because the matter is that in this modern time, modern time and era, we cannot simply tolerate another fascism, another Taliban, another dictatorial. Uh, regime, Taliban equivalents to Nazis, and we cannot simply tolerate that. But I appreciate your uh, your comment. Thank you. Hello. How do you um, respond to those critics who say that Western nations should not be exporting their values to countries and societies that don't want them? In fact, they have a, a term for it. It's called cultural imperialism. How, how do you respond to those critics? Thank you. That term, cultural imperialism, is very tricky. <laughs> and I wish that people actually use that appropriately in the right context, background, and history. Uh, given what's happening in Afghanistan, it was not cultural imperialism. Um, and so many Afghans can agree with me because um, human rights are not a Western value. Human rights is not just something we thought we learned and we were taught in the Western countries by Western feminists. It's human rights always existed about humans. Uh, in, I mean, in human civilization, even Muhammad's wife, she was a businesswoman. She was educated. She was aware about her rights. She knew about her rights, and she protected her rights, and she protected other Afghan, other Muslim women's uh, rights as well. And I gave an example of of uh, Saudi Arabia. It's about caring about other humans, and it's about NATO countries having a responsibility to make sure that the, the jihadis and the fascism doesn't spread out. We need to minimize the ideology of the Taliban and ISIS as much as possible, because this is a global issue. The, their ideology is definitely reaching uh, Canada, and it's very dangerous for Canada as well. Canada was heavily involved in Afghanistan. Actually, the Canadian government funded a school for Afghan girls' education in Kandahar, and that was very successful. Villagers and Afghan families uh, appreciated that, and they, they used that. And I'm going to repeat myself, it's a global issue, and it matters, and it matters for everyone. It should matter. Thank you. Thank you for your uh, presentation. I appreciate you taking the time to take questions after. Um, I'm not super familiar on this topic, so please correct me if I have any of my facts wrong here. But I recall a few months ago seeing um, some footage on social media of, I believe it was university, male university students walking out of class in response to the Taliban um, reversing their, uh, I guess, promise that they would allow female students into universities. So I was wondering if um, that was part of a more widespread, I guess, protest or how, you know, or if that was just an isolated incident. And if you're aware of any other similar, um, I guess you could call peaceful protest or peaceful resistance to the, to the Taliban by people from both, any gender. Uh, yeah, thanks. Do you mean the resistance from within Afghanistan against the Taliban? Yeah, sure, for sure. The youth in Afghanistan and women are definitely resisting the regime. They are protesting. They are protesting more than we can hear on social media and more than we can see. Afghan women are very active. And as I put one slide, that Afghan women are silent. Uh, I mean, uh, the world is silent, but Afghan women aren't. There are so many resistance, and s women are taking the risk uh, go to the classrooms, and they were turned away by the Taliban. Some of them even are beaten by the Taliban. One of our athletes, she went to a secret uh, gym in Afghanistan because gyms are banned by Taliban now. So women came together in her community, and they opened a secret gym where only women were allowed, and it was in by invitation only. She went there for a few months, and then Taliban somehow eventually found out about it, and they found her, and they hit her with AK-47 magazine on her left arm. 
Uh, so the resistance definitely uh, exists. This is where the international community's intervention, not cultural <laughs> imperialism, can take place and can support to support and empower Afghan women for this uh, movement and for the for the rights. Thank you. First of all, that was a phenomenal presentation that you did. Um, I think like anything like this, I think education is always important, and thank you. Uh, my question is, um, obviously, you're doing an enormous task with the Women Leagues of Tomorrow. Is there any collaboration with other countries that you can support for? Because I believe something like this is strength by numbers. It's not something you can do alone. So do you have collaboration with countries maybe in Europe, United States, or even I know you've mentioned earlier about the neighboring country of Pakistan where people are, do you, are you getting support like that? Unfortunately, no. Unfortunately, not the support that we actually need and what the support that we actually uh, use. As I also mentioned earlier, that unfortunately the world's attention is drifting away. The world is distracted about the war in Ukraine. Ukraine matters. I get it. I understand. Afghans were also victim of Russian uh, occupation in the 80s and 70s. We all are the victim of the same troll um, here. And anyone who's interested, I highly recommend reading the Soviet war in Afghanistan in the 80s and 70s. Unfortunately, we are not getting uh, much support. Um, to me, it feels like Afghan, Afghan women are just left on their own to fight the Taliban. We would love to s receive support from, from Canadian government, especially from neighboring countries, and also from the other Islamic countries. The other Islamic countries need to put pressure on the Taliban and condemn them that what they are doing is no longer is Islamic. It's, as I mentioned, it become unrecognizable. It's not what Islam says or what Islam does. So um, we would really appreciate such collaborations if they are available. We are looking for um, English language tutors and mentors. Uh, right now, our registration is open. Um, we would really appreciate if people step in and they uh, voluntarily uh, teach uh, Afghan girls in Afghanistan. We will connect them with the students uh, over the internet in Afghanistan. And it's r relatively safe and it can be done safely in Afghanistan because the Taliban hasn't shut down the internet connection because they also need for their propaganda. Um, so yeah, we, we would really appreciate such collaboration, especially from uh, teachers from Canada. Thank you so much. Hi there. Um, maybe I have two questions. The first question, being, could you share with us maybe the most inspiring story? I mean, there's a lot of inspiring stories. There's a lot of tough stories, but some of them are inspiring. And could you share with us, you know, in your, your work since the fall in uh, the government in 2021, what's an inspiring story of a young woman that you've worked with? Um, yeah, that's the first question, maybe. Yeah, sure, thank you. Um, when the government collapsed, um, same week, um, I was contacted by, a, by an 18 years old Afghan girl from Afghanistan uh, on Messenger. She spoke really good English and she asked me to help her find a scholarship. And I get, got to know her a little bit over the internet and I called her. I called her over the phone, it was like one week after the collapse. And she was very calm on the phone. And I was like, I am devastated here. Like, it, it took a toll on me. How are you so calm over the phone? And you could actually hear the gunfights, the US helicopter flying in the air because it was the same week that they were evacuating their stuff from the US embassy. And kids were crying in the background. And she said, I am calm because I want to become the first female president of Afghanistan and I will fix this problem. And I was like, how, how do you do that? How can you do that? And she says, look, Freiba, I'm 18 years old now. If you give me a chance to go to, to get a scholarship and study to North America, I'll become president by studying very hard. And by the time I complete my undergrad and master's degree, Taliban will be gone and I'll come back and I will become the first female president of Afghanistan. That was the conversation I cannot pass that stuck in my head. And that was the conversation that also helped me um, navigate my way through that chaos uh, with the 
Kabul evacuation, C-17 and everything, that helped me. And I immediately contacted one of the schools in Vancouver Island, Shawnigan Lake School, and they provided her a Fulbright scholarship right now. She's studying at grade 11. She's doing very well. She's participating in model UN conferences. She's representing Afghanistan. So those are the inspiring stories. That's the story of only one Afghan woman, but there are so many young women just like her who, is, who are equally deserving of rights and have to have the access to education. Thank you. So I guess my follow-up to the inspiring story is I'm sure you've inspired lots of people tonight. Women Leaders of Tomorrow, I understand, is volunteer-run. Um, you, I un understand, is, is not a charity currently, a nonprofit, fully volunteer-run, including yourself. How can the people in this room and others support you and your work? What's the best way to do that? You mentioned English language and that sort of support, but what other ways can the folks support the work? Because it, it sounds tiring, but also sounds inspiring. Thank you so much. I like that tiring and inspiring. That is what it has been uh, recently. Thanks. Um, yeah, um, currently we are looking for a board member to join our um, our organization. We're entirely run volunteer organization. I'm also a volunteer. It doesn't pay my paycheck. I'm a volunteer myself. Uh, I would volunteer my, my entire life uh, for this uh, cause. So we are looking for board members to join our team. We have amazing uh, team who, who are currently supporting us. If anyone is interested, um, he or she, they can contact us at info at womanleaders.ca and then we will contact her back with the uh, next steps. Thank you. Do we have other questions? Two more questions. Okay, I think those will be the last two questions. Thanks. Thank you. Friba, thank you very much for a very inspiring talk. For me, it brought back memories because I was in Afghanistan from 2007 to 2010, heading a humanitarian organization, and uh, saw firsthand a lot of uh, the challenges that the people were facing there. And uh, it's tragic uh, now that instead of leading to a better future, um, the situation reversed itself. To come back to today and further from the comments and questions that have been asked, how can we mobilize and or maybe let me turn it into a, perhaps a suggestion can we mobilize the universities and perhaps people to see if we can bring more of the young people, the young women, to Western universities? And it doesn't just have to be Canada. It can be other countries too. Um, I'm currently involved with bringing master's students from Syria and Tajikistan. And uh, they have, five have come to Canada, five have gone to Portugal. So it is possible to mobilize on a bigger scale. Um, it will take a lot of effort, but I think when you talk to people and inspire them the way you've been doing today, there is definitely hope that you know, you'll be able to pull more students in. Because what will happen, Taliban will be in power maybe five years, 10 years, as you pointed out, there are four options, anything could happen. And at that point, you will um, you know, need the manpower, the intelligent, uh, intelligent power to go back and rebuild the country. And a question for my wife, who has been a remote tutor for girls in Afghanistan in the past year. Um, the internet or doing it online is very challenging. Are they, have you, folks found easier ways. <laughs> thank you so much. And I also want to thank you for the work you did in Afghanistan. And those international de uh, development aid agencies were amazing. They um, did not only empower women and gender equality and also people, they also brought food on their table. Many, many people were employed. I'm sure you had many staff there 
who were on the, on your on your payroll they really appreciate it they they had food because of those uh, for for those jobs yes i believe that it's absolutely possible for universities in north america to mobilize at a greater scale to support more students from afghanistan and um, as i 100% agree with you it doesn't have to be canada there are many other good universities in the world as well for example the university for for women in uh, bangladesh american university in beirut american university in qatar and so many other good organ i mean um, universities i believe that if there is sympathy empathy and care you can achieve anything uh, you want. And I also highly recommend anyone who's interested in this topic to work with Afghan women run organization, grassroots organization, because we have the experience, we know the politics, we know the culture. Support us, support us, because we also have people on the ground who will complete the job even in a very dangerous situation, even under the Taliban regime, because they are local, because they know how to maneuver themselves safely, they can uh, do it. And to address um, uh, another question, how are we doing the uh, online tutoring program? So internet exists in Afghanistan, the Taliban didn't cut off, but it's very poor, it can be spotty, it can be tiring for the tutors and teachers. I totally understand. What we do, a Women Leaders of Tomorrow does, we raise funds and we send those funds to the students directly and students in Afghanistan buy data on their phones, buy extra data, maybe a little bit more, one GB, two GB, just a little bit more to have a better internet connection so they can connect with their tutors and teachers uh, online. It's still, it is challenging, but having that stipend, having that extra fund for the internet connection, it's helpful. Because everybody knows, everybody heard the news now that Afghanistan's 95% population is under starvation mode. That's almost everyone in Afghanistan right now. And that was the estimation that was done by the United Nations. So almost everybody is starving and people don't have extra $10, equivalent of $10 to buy data on their phone. So that's why we send them money over, um, over to Afghanistan so they can, um, they can buy data on their phones. Thank you so much for your question again. Hi. Um, first, I want to say thank you for the very insightful talk. I think uh, it's always so important to learn and hear firsthand from people who have experienced the realities of fascist regimes like that of the Taliban. Um, I'm a political science and women and gender studies uh, double major, and I'm very new to the politics and situation of Afghanistan. But um, I noticed that in your talk you mentioned how the Taliban is predominantly male, or actually all male, and how they specifically focus a lot of their oppression on women in Afghanistan. But I'm curious on how non-Taliban men have been put in that complex position in which they can either um, support or, um, I don't know, like uh, give in to Taliban ideology, um, the patriarchal sexist ideology, as a survival method or, you know, adhere to their morals and to true Islam, which doesn't oppress women the way the Taliban is trying to make it seem. And how we're seeing that, you know, as you mentioned, 95% of Afghanistan is in starvation. So how is that affecting the male population? It is definitely um, affecting them. Um, poverty, economic situation plays an important role as well. And that actually doesn't play on our favor because if people, especially young men, um, they don't have food to eat and support their families, they will join any group just to have food and support their families. And one of my, my political science professor back in, in 2015, he mentioned that um, one of the dangerous things in the world is the unemployed, bored young men they will join any group just for excitement or just a little bit support, just a recognition for that. So it's definitely affecting. I call the patriarchy in Afghanistan mini Taliban. So they're like a Taliban and they're like the mini Taliban. Afghan men who are absolutely against um, women's rights, women's freedom. They also have very similar uh, ideology like the Taliban when it comes to uh, women. So right now the situation is very uh, dire. It's very sensitive and um, some men have join the uh, Taliban group. Yeah, thank you for your question. 
I'm going to let one last question, okay, Nadine? <laughs> and then we're going to wrap up. Uh, thank you for, John, for your uh, amazing presentation and support you provide for women and girls in Afghanistan. So I am one of the lucky girls that who were evacuated from Afghanistan in 2021. So I know there are a lot of girls and women. They, are not, they were not lucky as me. So the same as you, I received many texts and messages from them. They are seeking for help. So what is your recommendation that what we can do for them beyond like online cl classes and like, yeah, this is my question. There are many things that um, the community here can support them with. Um, if the Afghan women are in Afghanistan, sorry, in, in Canada, um, they can do three things. And if that's one of the takeaway from today is to, to do three things. One, recognize an Afghan woman that she's an Afghan, where she's come from, coming from, just recognition for Afghan women that we exist, we matter. Uh, second, hire, hire an Afghan woman. If you're an employer, hire an Afghan woman. Be the first employer to give her the first job in Canada. And if you're in university, hire her as a student. Give her that opportunity, education opportunity that she deserves. English language is a barrier. I understand, believe me, it's my third language. I understand. But universities can accommodate that. The students can start from foundational classes to, to upgrade their English language, and then they can go for their regular studies. If you're a university, take that, take her as a student. And third, befriend one. Just make friendship with Afghan uh, women. Um, but if you mean how to support women in Afghanistan, work with the grassroots organization that are still standing. Women Leaders of Tomorrow is one of the last standing organization in Afghanistan. We're very careful, very strategic about our safety, but um, we're one of the last standing ones. Because we also had a sports component, sports program, our athletes became well-known public figures because they participated at the big competitions and they participated, participated in local interviews and radio station tele televisions channels. So, um, yeah, work with them directly ask Afghan women what do you need how can I help you is there something I can help you with, with based on her needs and you, we can accommodate resources to her thank you yeah, thank you very much everyone for your questions and Friba thank you very much for coming and being part of International Week and for sharing with us the work you are doing this the struggles that um, you're trying to overcome and for sharing your heart with us and inspiring us to join you in that very important work. I'm very grateful um, to have had this evening with you and I'm sure I can invite the audience to um, share that appreciation one more time in thanking you for coming. And uh, safe travels home, everyone. And there's more to come in International Week uh, if you're inspired. Thank you so much.